Good evening and a big welcome here to tonight's 5 by 15 and I couldn't be happier than to be welcoming Dan Saladino here with us. Um, Dan, for anyone who listens to the food programme on Radio 4, is a very familiar voice. He's also the presenter and producer and has been on the food program for around about 15 years. And over that time, he's brought us extraordinary stories about food, where it comes from, what it's doing, and the people behind it. And the people who very much, from the point of view of what we're going to talk about today, people who are trying to save different kinds of food. Now, the title of Dan's fantastic book called Eating to Extinction, which is published tomorrow, but this is effectively the launch event, the first that Dan has done, is really something that's very interesting, I think, to people, because when we most of us think of extinction, we tend to think of tigers in India or pandas or these big creatures that are being decimated or tuna in the sea. But in fact, the extinction of all the species of plants, and especially the plants that we eat, is probably an even bigger problem. And the stories and statistics in Dan's book are really quite breathtaking about how in a very few years, in certainly in terms of evolution, we've gone from this massive diversity down to these tiny, tiny amounts of foods, whether it's chickens or pigs or wheats or different kinds of grain that are owned by very few people. So we're going to try our best tonight to tell you, or Dan's going to tell you, a whole lot of extraordinary stories. But Dan, first of all, a really big welcome to tonight's show. Mm -hmm. And for the audience, please, you know, put your hands, your questions in the Q&A box, because we will allow time at the end. And if you want to buy the book, please go to New and Books. But Dan, let's just try and set up the you know, this is a really provocative title, Eating to Extinction. So what do you actually mean by that? Well, um, I went to um, Sicily back in 2007. So I'll just give you the, the background in terms of how the, how the book came into to existence. I, I lucked out in my very first edition of the food programme. Um, and uh, I come from a Sicilian background. My father's from a a place in the southwest called Ribera, where they grow lots of oranges. And the program editor said, well, do you have any ideas? Do you, what would you like to cover? And I said, well, I do know it's the uh, citrus harvest in uh, in Sicily right now. And I, I was surprised. They said, yeah, go for it. Sheila couldn't come on that particular trip. So I went on my own. And, um, and I, I was there recording stories of uh, citrus being harvested from around Etna, and these were blood oranges, the Moro and the Tarocco varieties uh, that people have loved for a very long time, uh, part of Sicilian culture, particularly on that side, eastern side of the island, uh, part, a really important part of the economy and, and also of the landscape as well, the citrus groves around um, Etna, for example, spectacular. Um, but when I was there, I was started to talk to farmers and they said well this is the last harvest uh, they just couldn't carry on the economics made no sense because oranges were coming in from north africa and spain and so that they were next year they were just going to leave the oranges on the trees and abandon them uh, and there was a meal that evening uh, with farmers and some of the people who were supporting the farmers uh, in, in the growing of the oranges and the, there were five courses and every course had um, citrus as part of the 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 menu as one of the ingredients and uh, so I was I was there and uh, sitting next to somebody who had traveled from northern Italy who was a member of the slow food organization and uh, he explained to me that you know supermarkets on the mainland were importing oranges from from elsewhere and that, that this was in decline and we need to save these oranges um, in Sicily and then he said well this is just one of the this is one of the stories that we are following at Slow Food and it's part of this thing called the Ark of Taste and then I discovered the Ark of Taste was a catalogue of endangered foods or foods that were pretty close to becoming extinct for all kinds of reasons. And I, I got back home and I went online and I looked at this list of endangered foods and I was blown away. Uh, and I, for almost the full 15 years of my time on the food programme, that has been my obsession. And I've been collecting stories, uh, as many as possible from that catalogue, which now stands at, I think, five and a half thousand foods and it's everything from 
animal breeds to cheeses to cereals, uh, hot types of honey uh, from 130 different countries. Um, and, and each one of those stories was for me just a beautiful story of diversity of the history of food and how food was important to the culture of a particular part of the world, uh, the, inge the ingenious ways in which humans had fed themselves. And it was each one was being told through a specific food, which was, which for me as a storyteller on radio was the, the beauty of it. It wasn't an academic treatment of extinction or endangered foods. This was, these were real stories of real people, places uh, and foods. And um, uh, and and one, uh, one confession I need to make is that in that time, I mostly collected them because I love the stories. When I started to write the book, that was when I joined the dots and realized there was something bigger and uh, something significant had happened in the last 60 or so years that had created this list of endangered foods. So before we start working through, you know, your book is divided beautifully into different sections of the main food groups that we eat, and each one has extraordinary stories. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we're all eating the same orange that comes from China? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and a, and a really complicated question that takes me 10 parts in the book to try and explain um, why, why it's happening and why it matters. But I, I, I break it down into three three main reasons. One is um, genetic diversity. And uh, what we now realize is that, um, and I guess it's like an investment portfolio. If, if you invest in just a small number of shares and something goes wrong, um, you, know, you can pay a heavy price for taking that level of risk. And that's pretty much what we have done with the global food system in the last 50, 60 years. Science and technology allowed us to become incredibly, incredibly productive with cereals, um, rice, maize, um, wheat, for example. Um, humans have cultivated around 6,000 different plant species. The world now depends mostly on nine, particularly the big three that I've just mentioned, 50% of global calories. Um, what we now understand is that as our world changes, we need options for the future. And those options include genetic diversity, because what has happened to those crops and those plants and animal breeds as they have been domesticated over 10,000 years and then spread around the world, they have adapted to local conditions. And in, you know, in terms of the evolution of those different plants and animals, they have their different strengths and weaknesses. And if we've narrowed down our selection to a tiny number, we are losing those options. We are losing that diversity. We are losing that safety net. And we might get into some of these stories in this conversation about wheat or rice, but there are diseases spreading around the world that are impacting on all, all of our foods. Um, and we need diversity. So do genetic diversity is, is one important reason. The second I would argue is, um, you know, there are economic uh, reasons. So I think, you know, a lot of the stories that I tell in the book are how um, a particular food has been at the heart, not just of a, um, the way in which a community fed itself, but also its economy. Um, and I think that's, that's one thing that's, that's had a huge impact. So again, with the Green Revolution, 60, 70 years and decades that have followed, rural depopulation as being a, a, a big issue um, for good and bad. Um, but I think the economics of some of these foods and the fact that they've been so undervalued that we and we need to value them now. One reason why they've become endangered is because the farmers have left the land because they haven't been valued and they haven't been rewarded. The final reason, and again, there are more, but these, these are the really important ones for me, is the, the cultural um, value of these foods and what they mean for identity as well. And, and that go, it's almost a philosophical question of what does it mean to be human? Uh, d d to be human, does that mean that we are all um, we, we we end up growing the same kinds of foods, eating the same kind of diet around? I mean, I don't think that is the story of 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 our species, humans, over that period of time. Diversity has been one of the the great achievements in so much of what we have done, and that diversity is disappearing. So, what does that mean to be a human being in one part of the world or another? And I think food is one of the great. Um, I think one of the things we've helped create, as well as obviously being given by nature, um, that, that reflects who we are. And to lose that would be a tragedy. I think that's really interesting because it is about the, 
your cultural identity and your area identity. So let's start going through the big big food groups because the stories are so great. And I know you've got some examples. So wheat, as you say, one of the really big ones. What, what happened to wheat? And I'm going to time you. You haven't got a lot of time. Oh, okay. To well, this is almost like a... Let, let's get... Also talk about tuna <laughs> and salmon and cheese yeah. and chicken. It's almost so, like a, yeah. Let, let's try and do this as, as a almost like a quick a fire round. Um, so uh, again, um, the the treatment I, uh, I I I use in the book is is not to try and I'm not an academic or a botanist or I'm a storyteller. So what I do is I went I travelled in search of stories, and in eastern Turkey, uh, I um, went to um, a, a village called Buyat Katmar, which is north of the Fertile Crescent, where wheat itself was domesticated we think around 10 12000 years ago this is kavulja so this is the wheat that i traveled all the way to eastern anatolia to see and the reason why i wanted to see this is because it's um uh called emma it's an emma wheat uh, which mm -hmm. along with iron corn was one of the earliest domesticated um types of wheat um and as you can see it's got long horns it's 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 got these thick husks hulls that are highly protective of the crop itself. Buyat Katmar itself in eastern Turkey is high, it's mountainous, it's damp, um, prone to a lot of diseases for crops because you know um, a fungus is is very could would be ha very happy there. This has kept um, generations and generations of farmers and, and families fed, um, possibly back you know seven eight thousand years. Um, and it's now in the hands of just a few farmers. We know it's disease resistant. We know it's nutritious. They love the taste of this wheat. They love the look of this wheat in, the, in their fields. Emma itself was the wheat that uh, the earliest civilizations were, were built on. So ancient Egypt and the pyramids, that was an Emma food culture. The people who built Stonehenge, um, they, they would have been growing and eating Emma wheat. And with the Roman Empire and beyond, bread wheat really starts to, to go on the rise. But it's really in the in the Green Revolution of the 1960s that this wheat really did disappear from, from Turkey. And uh, yeah, it backs up the, I guess the case I'm trying to make is that we need this diversity now. We don't know what kind of scenarios in which this will prove uh, useful, but we can't afford to lose it because thousands of years of adaptation for this to exist and in our lifetimes, it could disappear. So how many different breeds of wheat do we, we use, you know, worldwide now? You know? Uh, what I found is diversity is really hard to measure. And so you get all kinds of figures being banded around and people talk of varieties or types or accessions. What we do know is that in, in the sea vault in the Arctic Circle, Svalbard, um, there are more than 200,000 samples of, of wheat. Um, and a lot of them um, haven't been researched. We don't know exactly what they are, but we know there's an enormous um, amount of diversity. If you are a farmer in the UK now, you would receive something called the recommended list, which is where bakers and other um, you know, millers, people who, um, uh, I, I guess, process most of the wheat in the UK, um, uh, th 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 those, those kind of... Um, professions and, and industries along with some academics as well they will test different wheats as they are bred um, and the list that they they create the recommended list at the moment there's just uh, there's just under 10 bread wheats that um, are on that recommended list um, and uh, you know again they they are recommended because they fit the food system that we have created in Britain which is mostly for white sliced bread so huge amounts of diversity have been lost. Um, and, you know, many people would make the case um, that that big push for productivity after the Second World War was for a good reason. That, that you know, the war, uh, people were hungry, there was risk of famine, um, new science and technology, plant breeding um, that, uh, that had really been developed at the beginning of the 20th century was really coming into its own. Um, and it seemed to many people at the time as the way in which we could feed the world. But we know a lot more now, and we're seeing obviously the impacts of food, the, of the food system on the environment, on our health, all these other reasons why we need to not go back, but look to what has gone before as clues in terms of uh, a better food system. 
Yeah, that's that's a really important point. I'm just digging out one one fact, and I mean, as Dan said, you know, this, one of the joys of this book is that he takes the very short chapters about very specific um, cheeses or wheats or whatever it is. But one fact that really um, shocked me was in China in the 1950s there were 1,300 varieties of rice and by 2014 it was down to 84 and that's just you know within sort of within all our lifestyles so um the next next story that would be great to talk about is the fate of the atlantic salmon and indeed you know the tuna and i know you've got a little sample of tuna there mm. but the atlantic salmon is a terrible story it's sort of heartbreaking mm. it is and and the, and the wild atlantic salmon is also um you know, if you could have a multi-species metaphor, it's it's the canary in the mine, because um, because of its very special properties, um, which is called an anadromy. You know, it starts off as a freshwater fish and then becomes an ocean-going um, creature. Um, it, it it's a reflection of what has happened on land, and it's a, a reflection also of what we have done uh, to the oceans as well. Um, and it isn't a, 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 just a, a recent. Uh, phenomenon of the of the wild Atlantic salmon coming under pressure. Um, you know that there are rivers in Europe which were polluted with the Industrial Revolution, where salmon um, uh, runs started to uh, to disappear. Um, but it, but I think it, it again it's in the in the twentieth century where really things come into the their own because of intensive fishing. So, um, you know, we, we went from, um, uh, you know, certain types of uh, fishing, more intensive fishing. We, we targeted the salmon as it um, entered its um, fishing grounds in the North Atlantic. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of the con contemporary story, um, you know, the, the, the ocean temperatures are changing. Different species are entering waters that only the salmon used to, well, not only, but where, where the salmon used to dominate. And so there's competition for food. Um, it's a really complex, um, but revealing story, uh, Wild Atlantic Salmon. And then obviously there's the, the fascinating and important to understand story of aquaculture. And mm. the fact that at the same time, we are seeing the wild Atlantic Salmon, or we're seeing the Atlantic Salmon become one, becoming one of the most endangered fish in the world. But also one of the most abundant because of salmon farming as well, um, and so I, I you know, there, there is um, a point I make in the book that, that there are many people who think the two are connected. Yes, and I think that the salmon producers have been very clever because we have all been led to believe this is a really healthy um, and okay thing to eat. But in fact, when you read your description and other descriptions of what it's like for these magnificent creatures to be stuck and grown up in a cage where they get attacked by sea lice. It's a very different image, isn't it, that appears. Mm. But also it's it, it's a really difficult one um, to, to, to really make judgment on because um, aquaculture now, according to the you know, UF, UNFAO, is going to be an important component in food security. A lot of people who've gone into the industry did so because they felt they believed that they were um, conservationists, that they were there to um, uh, supply farmed fish, which would then take pressure off the wild fish. It's an extremely complicated um, story in terms of the science of, of the impact of the farmed lice on the wild and also um, uh, integration as well, the way in which um, if uh, farm salmon escapes into the into the sea what does you know to what extent does that weaken um you know the gene pool of the of the wild this is an unfolding story and the fascinating thing for me is i tell so many stories in the book of domestication of you know how plants and animals were domesticated ten thousand years ago this this is one that's unfolding in our lifetimes so um salmon farming and the farmed salmon as a species effectively came in in the 60s and 70s um, and so it's almost as if, you know, the people who were there eight, nine, ten thousand years ago to watch um, the, the domestication of what became cattle, we're seeing the domestication of this new fish species. How really interesting. If you took one of these salmon from a pen in the sea and you put it in a river in fresh water, would it survive? Some do survive, which is why there is a concern that, that, the, um, that, that this... Uh, they could mate and uh, or, or um, spawn and um, create a weakening of the wild 
gene pool. Um, I mean, and, and the really important feature about salmon is that it has this, perhaps it's like a chemical imprint that it, you know, it leaves the river of its birth, goes out to sea, swims thousands of miles and then returns to exactly the same spot as well. Now, uh, the, sam, the, the, the farm salmon are not bred to do that. They, they are bred for um, uh, fast um, growth, um, a very efficient feed conversion, uh, whereas the wild is a completely different um, uh, species in terms of that imprint that it receives from the river, river of its birth. So it's a, you know, it's an, a, a, compl a, a very complicated interaction between the two. And you've got a bit of um, dried tuna with you, I know. Yeah, well, I, I think that this this for me, and I'm going to I'm going to open it now because it does uh, have a very strong smell. But um, this is uh, <laughs> a food that comes from southern China, um, and let me just this is called chiu katsu. Um, and it's um, tuna uh, preserved in salt. And uh, I mean, and, and it's a it's a, a food with um, thou, uh, you know, a thousand years of history behind it. But what and what this um, why I find this so interesting for two reasons. One is um, the, the why it became endangered, and this was um, uh, being produced quite widely um, up until the early twentieth century. Um, and we think of you know Japanese food culture as being one protected by tradition and and is unchanging, um, but it was a mostly vegetarian um, food culture uh, through the nineteenth century. But in, uh, towards the end of the twentieth um, century, after um, so Japan had opened up again, um, the uh, um, to actually want to uh, keep up with Western, what they perceived as being the strengths of Western uh, economies and cultures, they switched to a more meat-based diet. And so this started to fade away. But what, what was lost is not just only the, the skills of making this um, in, ingenious food, which can be preserved. This is, this is grated over vegetables. And, it, and what it means is a tiny, tiny amount of protein is added to vegetable, a vegetable dish, which then transforms its flavors uh, becomes delicious, lots of umami, adds protein to the meal, but it just shows you how meat in many traditional cultures was just a garnish. You know, it was a, a much prized, valued, and an often rare addition to uh, diets. I'll put that that's back, so it, is, it is quite smelly, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's really interesting how in the 20th century we, we push so much towards meat, and so maybe we should jump straight to the life of the chicken and how that has gone from being, well, a sort of Sunday treat, which even when I was the kid, it was a sort of Sunday treat, to being everywhere, and how narrow the gene pool is now. Mm. What is the well, story? in fact, I mean, I go back further than, than my childhood, which again is, is similar to yours in the rarity of, of, of chicken as food. But I mean, I go back seven and a half thousand years to the domestication of the red jungle fowl. And, and as I mentioned about that process of domestication that, you know, um, as it spreads, uh, diversity is created in, in the case of um, what became chickens. Um, uh, the, at the moment, um, it's thought there are 1500 locally adapted uh, breeds of, of chickens still out there. Um, and again, that, that in, it's important to, to emphasize that word adapted. They are adapted to the, you know, the, the temperatures, the access to water, the, the, the food around them. But it was um, in parallel with the Green Revolution, the idea that, you know, this um, uh, push for bigger, faster, better, um, it, it, as you know, in terms of that, that was the, the view that, that you know, these bigger breasted birds would, were the future. And so they, they uh, launched in America the Chicken um, of Tomorrow competition, which then resulted in, uh, you know, a, a couple of breeds uh, and, and it's their genetics really that gave us the, the global bird that, that we, we now know um, very well because 70 billion of them are slaughtered uh, each year. And, you know, they can grow to um, uh, a weight for slaughter in about 35 days, which is a, a bit longer than a house fly. So, you know, in terms of taking that wild animal and transforming it, um, that is, you know, that and the speed at which that happened. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's linked to the Green Revolution as well in because of the abundance of cereals um, that we and, and other um, uh, grains and, and uh, pulses uh, that we produced that became uh, 
it became possible to feed that to animals and you know that's why pork industry and the poultry industry is what it is uh today as well but um what we are now starting to see in europe um is the introduction of slower growing birds because of um, certainly welfare um concerns that that have been expressed over the um the, the speed of growth of these these birds which there are three main um breeds that are um kind of the global um success stories of the of the industry and their genetics are owned by just two uh companies um and it's it's almost like uh f1 you know hybrid maize that if you have those chickens um it's an intricate breeding process you have to go back to the supplier you know the the people who own the genetics in order to restock um yeah so it's so that it's for me again it's an illustration of how how rapid that that change has been in our food system and in our lifetimes how that food its status has changed and it's become so abundant how can a company own a gene like that? well they, they invest they invest millions and millions of you know dollars and pounds in in um in breeding programs um to to keep improving these um the these birds that are that, that are adapt adapted to those conditions of um you know to be to be grown at speed with high feed conversion rates um and, and so yeah huge amounts of investment to deliver the the type of bird suited to that environment so that's that's the the kind of the ownership um part of the story is to arrive at so, a bird that that is um capable of growing uh, that quickly in that system uh, to produce the uniform sizes, um, which is another feature of our modern food system, that takes a huge amount of um, expertise to, to arrive at that in, in terms of breeding programs. And um, which is, I mean, I, and I do pose this question in the book, uh, um, uh, and it was a story told um, first um, to me by Gregor Larson, who at Oxford University who, who studied the domestication and the history of the, the chicken. And he describes this story um, of um, uh, a big poultry shed in Brazil where they had a, a problem of aggressive birds and pecking each other and, um, and the birds becoming injured and profits were falling. But in the corner of this shed, there, were, there was a group of, um, uh, of chickens who weren't pecking each other. And on further investigation, it turned out that these birds couldn't see, they were blind chickens and therefore they couldn't interact in the same way as the other birds. I mean, it turns out this is a philosophical or this is a, um, a, a theory that was uh, actually put forward as well. Perhaps that's that's where we should take the bird next is to breed blind chickens. Um, and it poses the question of how much further do we want to go? I mean, how, how far can we take this? Perhaps the blind chicken is um, uh, the bird of the future. But, but is that what we want? And is that where we want to take this, this system? Yeah, well, that's a very, that's a terrifying story. Um, questions are starting to come in. Do please put them in and we will come to them in about 15 minutes or so. But I feel we should just, um, we've mentioned a couple of times the whole thing of the Green Revolution. Can you just say quickly what it was? Because it does obviously inspire so much of this in a way, including the chicken, because things like soya came out of it and well it, yeah i mean it was um uh after after the war i mean it started in in um, with a, with a breeding program uh in mexico and uh the, the 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 person who is associated most um uh powerfully with the, the green revolution is norman borlaug um and the the challenge was uh, with, with funding from um, foundations in America, Norman Bullock was an American, um, to try and alleviate poverty, to increase yields, to try and help farmers in Mexico by improving their, um, their wheat uh, to make it more disease resistant, um, and which he was extremely successful at doing. Uh, and he found this dwarf wheat in Japan, or he didn't find the dwarf wheat. Somebody found the, a dwarf wheat in Japan that, that he then used in his breeding programs. Um, some, there are some amazing documentaries on this, which I, I would recommend people watch because it throws up so many questions about what was happening at that time, uh, you know, in terms of the Cold War as well. 
but to cut that long story short, that Borlaug was successful and very quickly recognizing the importance of what he had created, um, for which he then later received the Nobel Prize, um, that wheat was so successful and um, so, so high yielding that it quickly went from um, being a Mexican food story to a global one, that in um, India, in Pakistan, um, and then later in, in other parts of the world, um, that the narrow selection of green revolution wheat um, spread quickly. The, the catch was, uh, and Norman Borlaug himself acknowledged that, that this wasn't a long-term fix. Uh, this would save lives, uh, preventing famine uh, by having these, these, you know, these, these highly productive um, varieties of wheat. It, it required um, a lot of water, so irrigation. It required chemical inputs, uh, fertilizer um, uh, and synthetic fertilizer um, and other chemicals for these um, green revolution crops to, to perform uh, to their optimum and, and, and produce as much um, wheat as, as, as Borlaug um, discovered that they could. Um, and now we realize, here we are in um, you know, 2021, um, water, the energy, <laughs> fertilizer is a big story right now, obviously, the energy required uh, for production of fertilizer, the impact of, of that farming system um, uh, on the planet is, is now a serious question. And we need to find our way through that. And, and I'm not passing judgment in the book on the Green Revolution, I'm telling it for what it is and trying to summarize the history as best I can to, to explain how we got to where we are today. Um, and I think that is the big question of, of where we go next, but I am convinced that the stories that I, I tell in the book of, of those, uh, you know, those plants and animals that did take our ancestors thousands of years to create, that diversity matters and is important and, and should not be lost as easily as it is being lost. And certainly the amount of chemicals that we've been putting on the soil has massively weakened it, damaged water systems, damaged the oceans right the way through. So can you talk a bit about soya? Because it's just one of those things that is sort of everywhere. And you know, one reads about the fact that we feed our animals soya that's been grown in deforested land in Brazil. And yet at the same time, soya is also quite a kind of healthy thing. Mm. And if you have it as say the Japanese have it. Yeah. In Tapu is soya. Um yeah, and that's that's where I went to to tell this story. I went to uh, Okinawa, so the island in the Pacific south of mainland Japan, uh, to meet a farmer who, um, as I describe it in the book, had, had the smallest plot of soy possibly in the world. So uh, Okinawa had its own um, uh, variety of soy, and, and the attraction for the farmers of this soy was that it grew quite quickly, which meant that it could outpace the insects before the rainy season. So it was adapted to the conditions of Okinawa. But during the, um, certainly the, uh, after the Second World War with American occupation, where they transformed the farming system of Okinawa, they, they encouraged the growing of more sugarcane, for example, um, that soy variety was lost. And so were many, many thousands of others around the world. Uh, um, there were plant explorers who were traveling through Asia sent by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, at the beginning of the 20th century, and they saved lots of diversity. That then becomes the American soy industry. Once mm -hmm. um, the scientists figured out how you could process this, this bean and, and capture lots of the protein and the oils within. Um, and then um, what, what, what I found fascinating is, is this story of what happens to um, protein in the uh, in, in the 70s. So as as we are seeing, you know, the livestock boom and the poultry industry starting to to really take off um, a lot of the protein that was being supplied at the time, which was from um, the uh, uh, anch anchovy fisheries in around South America, um, for various reasons that became that that uh, was depleted. Uh, there was a protein panic. Um, uh, America at that time was the biggest soy producer in the world, um, but started to export less uh, so it could keep more more soy to feed to its own cattle. Uh, so more to its own and uh, uh, pigs and its other um, uh, kind of yeah, bits of the, the meat industry. Um, 
Asia had become dependent on American soy exports. And so it was with Japanese investment that Brazilian soy cultivation really took off. And it really grew rapidly, which is why we now um, are concerned about expansion, increase, well, it's already expanded to the point where we know there's been deforestation in the Amazon and the Sahado as well. Um, but the history of that and why that happened and how quickly that happened and the and soy itself being so obscure outside Asia uh, right up until the 1970s. And now most of our diets are dependent on soy if we um, are meat eaters. And of course, it, it does also mean that many um, indigenous tribes in the Amazon are losing not just their land, but they're losing their lives, really, their lifestyle mm. and their culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, that's a that's um, a story that really threads through the early parts of the book as well, because I mean, particularly um, I start the book off with the story of uh, it's called Wild. And so that does include indigenous food cultures and the way they have been impacted by colonialism and you know uh, past and present so colonialism as we understand it in the um you know from 1492 and beyond but also a, a form of colonialism where western farming systems and western foods are being imposed on indigenous food cultures and in brazil and well and in other countries in south america i mean there's been a terrible um, amount of executions of activists trying to preserve tribal life haven't they Mm. Presumably that is coming from some of these massive pressures, financial pressures of the corporations. Yeah. And uh, the yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this tension that exists. And again, it's just history repeating itself of, you know, as, as we saw in um, in the Americas, as as we saw in Australia, um, you know, the the um, yeah, the impact of someone else's food system. Um, destroying another yeah yeah I remember being in Grenada and where they you know literally you could chuck seeds from any old balcony and the soil was so fertile and anything would grow but in fact they were importing wheat from Canada and their whole uh, growing of things like cassava and all their old staple crops all fallen into nothing and they were just an importing net importing country um the, um, we've got lots of questions and thank you. Keep them coming. I'm going to get to them. Can you just talk a little bit about cheese? Because uh, it was probably the chunk of the book where I thought oh, I've never really thought about cheese and how, how tiny it's, its focus is, but how unbelievably important. Yeah, and I, again, I mean, I, I, I um, there are some amazing books just written about cheese and, uh, it, it it to me it seemed like a familiar story but I uh, the things that stood out for me as I was I was researching it and, and telling these stories was one um, the way in which um, the origins of cheese are thought to be connected to the fact that you know of, la of la la lactose intolerance and it was through the processing of milk into cheese that, that um, it became more palatable to humans uh, but obviously it's the it's the capture of um, energy from the sun into grass um, that meant that humans could live in in places in, in parts of the world that were before impossible to live in so you know mountain communities could move into mountainous areas by taking their cattle who could then transform the the pasture into an edible food via milk um, and so I just love that story and, and the, one of the places I, I was lucky enough to um, to travel to um, was in northern Albania in the Albanian Alps, where I got to see a cheese um, being made called Mishavin. And it's one of the last remaining cheeses that is still um, made using goat skin. So it's a sack cheese. It's, it's, it's um, for matured inside this animal skin, buried away somewhere in a, in, in a cool uh, environment. And it's there as survival food. So after the, the bounty of summer, um, this food was made and huge amounts of it was made, stored, and then in the, in the depths of winter there it was to, um, to consume. So for me, in terms of, again, the, the, it's the ingenuity of our ancestors in finding these solutions and using and working in harmony with nature as well, because the other part of the story that fascinates me 
is that it isn't just a, an extinction or skills and flavors that are becoming endangered. It's also that you know microbes are becoming endangered because cheese is cheese because of this you know microbial activity that exists um, you know in the milk that that is also linked to the environment as well. And obviously pasteurization in terms of uh, liquid milk, that was a uh, you know big development in in the 19th and into the 20th century. Um, the risks are less so in cheese because of the, the fermentation process and the buildup of lactic acid. Uh, and so you know by killing off all the microbes in the milk, it meant that the diversity of cheese, but also you know the diversity of, of microbes, which is um, something that I touch on towards the end of that section. And I I, I visit the uh, company um, um, Christian Hansen in. Uh, Denmark, um, who supply now uh, a lot of cheesemakers around the world um, with starter cultures, but they, at the same time, they they are the Svalbard of of for cheesemakers in the sense that they they now um, travel around the world in search of um, start collections of starter cultures uh, and store them in the, in one of the biggest freezers in the world um, because microbes are so important um, and are becoming endangered from our food. And from our, again, it is too complicated perhaps to get into, but all of this is also connected to our health and uh, in a lot of interest right now in, in our gut microbiome and the diversity in our gut microbiome as well. That's really important. We understand now um, for, the, for our health. So let's come, because we're now, I want to start bringing in some questions because they're piling up. I mean, let's come to the kind of optimistic things and especially maybe talk a little bit about the HASDA and, this thing of diversity, as you say, people are getting really interested in the damage we do to our health by this very, very narrow diet mm. lacking massively in vegetables, uh, mm. especially in the West. And what do they, they eat maybe 30, 40, 50 different types of things in a day. Is that right? Well, they are surrounded. And this is a, this is through this, through the year. So there's, there are seasonal um, changes that, that happen, but they are surrounded by a potential menu of 800 different plant and animal species. And the Hadza are thoroughly modern human beings who choose to live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and they are some of the last of the hunter-gatherers in Africa uh, who practice no farming. And there are two, two or three hundred remaining Hadza who, who live that hunter-gatherer life, lifestyle. And so through these modern hunter-gatherers, um, for me, again, it's a clue in terms of who we are and where we came from, that that diversity was important. You know, it, that, that diversity is important in our evolutionary story. And, it, and they act for me as a reminder of, of something that is missing from my, my world, my life, that level of diversity. I cannot be a hunter gatherer. I, you know, I don't live in uh, around the lakes, the shores of Lake Iassi, but I should strive in some way to bring that kind of diversity into my into my life so uh and you know they are there living that lifestyle because they choose to and it makes them happy as hunter gatherers and that's another clue i think of, of how diverse you know human existence can be human lifestyles can be well that's 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 really interesting so do you feel do you feel optimistic by what you see at the moment this kind of in, really increased well, interest in food and its connection to climate change and you know you you can see how the world connects through the things we eat well i like to think that the book is an optimistic read because it's not just about do stories of doom and gloom and things disappearing and uh, you know what happened you know 200 years ago or, or 50 60 years ago it, it very much is about the people who are out there today saving these foods and again, going back to that story in 2007 and the, and the collecting I've been doing from this catalogue that Slow Food, Slow Food created of the, of the Ark of Taste. You know, every two years in Turin, they bring together thousands of people who have one thing in common is that they want to save these foods and their cultures and their traditions. And they believe also that they, they are the guardians of something that, that the world needs going into the future. Um, right. So I'm optimistic that they are out there and they are fighting and saving and enjoying this diversity. Um, and I'm also optimistic that I think, um, you know, thinking is changing on this. 
tomorrow um, the, the book comes out, but also you know, far more significant is the fact that there is the UN Food Systems Summit taking place mm. in New York. It's the first time there has been a summit on food systems. And what I mean by that is that a summit that will connect all the dots, yeah. you know, that it, it will actually look at the whole system. And it's an it's an attempt to try and unpick some of the things that are going on. And I and I know because I've been following this story, diversity is one of the key issues that will um, uh, be talked about, debated, discussed um, at, at the summit. And then finally, I mean, just look, think about the news today and in the last few days of of this fertilizer. Um, you know, natural gas prices go up, fertilizer grinds to a halt, CO two supplies stop big question being raised about you know um the impact on the food supply chain how many of us realize that supply chain work that way and how dependent we were on or are on those two those two plants in the uk to make that system work and how revealing to all of us of how fragile this system is and if that isn't a a reminder that diversity matters i i don't know what is i mean i think that's a re it's a really important story so there's a question here from Mark Ainsbury, who you know and I know well. Um, I mean, he he has raised this. Do you see the parallels between the issues you raised and the very topical interruptions to our fragile supply chains and how safeguarding against extinction could help feed people in an uncertain but hopefully more sustainable future? Which I think sort of hits the nail on the head with what you're saying. Mm. Again, it's that it options for the future. And that could be about crop diversity. It could be about the genetics in, you know, the 7,000 or so rare breeds that now exist around the world. Options for the future, um, uh, uh, the ability for us to adapt our food system to whatever happens in the future. Um, and, and also, I think that idea of um, systems that, that are resilient because they are more regional or local in their makeup so that, that you actually can protect yourselves from some of the well as we are seeing some of the knock-on effects that could happen in, on one side of the world impacting on another yes so um this is a question i think that everybody who's listening um will want to have an answer to max fraser says are extinctions inevitable or can individuals listening to this talk do anything to affect change? I think the answer is yes. So mm -hmm. what would what would you say back would be your top things? For yeah, to well, I, I th um, two, two things. Uh, one, one is um, there was a farmer that I met in Southwest China who was the last farmer saving a, a, a variety of rice that was, uh, again, really important. Um, uh, culturally, also important in terms of its um, disease resistance. And I thought, well, when this farmer dies out, then um, uh, the, the rice will die with him. I mean, it's just that he doesn't have any children and you know, everyone else in the area had switched over to the um, uh, you know, modern, modern varieties of wheat. He then got out his phone and there he was on WeChat communicating with people who were buying his rice in Beijing or Chengdu or you know other, other big urban cities I you know I, th I think modern technology is going to be a way in which we can link and have a direct connection with producers and farmers and then we so that way we can do our bit for uh, to save diversity but also you know uh, and, and it's flippant sometimes to, to say well you know grow your own and plant a seed and save diversity but it is possible and there's a story of somebody um, in the book uh, who a lot of people um, uh, admire uh, someone who passed away, uh, Isaiah Levy, who he would take a carrier, supermarket carrier bag full of, full of soil and plant a seed and save because he wanted to help save diversity as well. And this is a story that's been unfolding um, in, the, in the UK for many, many decades. One example of that is the Heritage Seed Library based in Coventry, um, set up in the 1970s because people could see what was happening and they were, they were concerned about disappearing diversity. Um, and that's a membership organization, a charity that exists to save diversity of what has been grown in this country. This is an interesting question to me, because I never know the answer to this. Imam Hani asks, could the wheat varieties be improved to be disease resistant without using genetic engineering? But I want to extend the question to ask what you think about genetic engineering, which a lot of people are placing a lot of faith in as mm. a way of making less disease, et cetera. It seems to me that there's, 
unintended consequences tend to happen when we muck around? Mm. Well, the, fir the first part of, of the question, um, yes. So there are conventional breeding programs underway. Uh, and for example, at the John Innes Center, they hold a collection of wheats that were uh, put together by a guy called Arthur Watkins in the 1930s, uh, who used the British Empire and its civil service network to um, get seed sent to him in Cambridge. So uh, I think he ended up with about seven and a half thousand uh, varieties of, of cereals, including lots and lots of wheat and Emma and einkorn types of wheat. And um, they are now they are now exploring the Watkins collection to breed, you know, more resilient wheats for the future. The big question for me is, does that just mean that we are repeating the same problem of creating new you know, types of wheat that we will then plant again as uh, uniform monocultures? Mm -hmm. Or actually, is there a way in which we can create more diverse crops as you know, a new, new um, evolutionary populations of wheat and you know, land races? Um, that I think is the, as you say, the unintended consequences. Science can be, a, a, you know, it's given us such, such, so many amazing things, but we, we need to get out of the cycle of just thinking, well, you know, it, there's a fix, a techno fix for this, and it's create this super wheat, and then we're going to plant acres and acres of it, uh, thousands of acres of it. Um, and there we are again, another um, uh, monoculture. The, the second part about you know, biotechnology, <clears throat> um, Again, this is something I, I've looked at as a, as a journalist, and you know, and I my <clears throat> I keep my my mind open. I think we should keep our options open. Um, the only thing I would say is that there are key, you know fundamental questions about what kind of systems um, that technology will lead to, and also who owns it. Yeah. Um, so I think you know the research should should carry on, and and we should we we should. Um, we should find out what, what is possible. But I think there are, again, um, characteristics of our food system currently uh, that, that teach us that um, diversity is important. And that also, I think, um, is an argument that many people make about the diversity of um, technologies and ownership and systems as well, because we don't want to come up with one amazing technology and then it displaces everything else. And this is why I'm saying diversity is important. So We've got this far into this conversation rather amazingly without talking about the gigantic companies like Monsanto and Cargill, you know, who own so much of the food we eat, both its growth and its processing and its transport. Can we really get diversity unless we bust open ownership? Mm. Yeah, good question. And um... I, I, again, it's something that really struck me when I was looking at uh, how, how this happened and then what happened next, because there is this you know, process of consolidation that really starts to take off in the 1970s. And it's wherever you look really in the food system. So from the seed companies, as you say, you know, four big seed companies own a majority, um, over 50 percent of, of, of global seeds and, and the seed and the trade in seeds as well. Um, brewing, you know, um, you know, one in four um, beers drunk around the world, you know, it's a product of one brewer. Uh, we, we talked about chickens before. Um, and again, I, you know, it, it's, it's one of those striking things that it's behind our food, but so few of us really understand it or, or, or realize that it's, it's the case. Um, and I think power in the food system is, is one of the key, key areas that, that people around the world express concern over. So I don't think you can change the food system um, without, ex ex you know, take, <laughs> without looking at, at the, those uh, very big, powerful structures. But along, along with that, I would also put the idea of how, you know, how subsidies are used as well. Subsidies are an incredibly powerful tool by governments to encourage or um, secure different forms of production, but also they they have the ability to distort what is grown and what and what we eat as well. So um, I think a lot of emphasis is placed on our behaviour as individuals and the choices we make. But I, I think sometimes you know too much emphasis is placed on on that. And I think the point that you made about consolidation and corporate ownership and also the use of subsidies 
you know, uh, um, yeah, that, that they create incredibly powerful forces that, that, that um, determine so much of what is grown and what we eat. So yes, there have been a number of questions from Jake, Anita Macri and various other people about, about this whole area. And I, I hope, I mean, is this going to be the case that in the UN Food Summit, they will start to look at that. The, the, as you say, that the level in, certainly in America of the subsidies around those big monocrops is insane. Why would you grow anything else if you can get that kind of money? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that is what the food system summit should be delivering. It's those big questions. I, and, and, you know, you can listen to, um, you know, a lot has been written and, the, and radio programs made. Uh, over questions posed about the UN Food System Summit and who's at the table or who or who has um, influence uh, on the people at the table, um, but but that that is this this should be seen as an opportunity to ask those extremely big questions of how did we get here, how does it work, what do we need to change to make a big difference to the impact of food production on the planet, but also, you know, human health, uh, you know, in terms of the welfare of farmers. Um, yeah, all of that, because it is part of the system. Uh, we are hoping, uh, all of us who, you know, look at, at food systems and some of the consequences and as journalists, the stories we get to tell, um, you know, I think there are high, high hopes uh, that this summit will at least start to raise big questions and join the dots. Yes, um, I absolutely agree. Um, quite a lot of questions here about soil health. Tom Scrope, your thoughts on soil health and how food species diversity links to this crucial area. Um, it's obviously hugely important, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, just very briefly, I do um, tell a story of, uh, of a lentil that actually did go extinct in southern Germany, the Swabian uh, Alp lentil. Um, and it disappeared in the 60s. I think at the same time, Canada was pushing forward and becoming a big supplier, export, a global exporter of lentils. Um, it disappeared from the Swabian Alps, and it was brought back by, one, by a farmer who went to the Vavilov Institute and found the seeds the, of, of the um, lentils that disappeared. And the reason he wanted it, it wasn't just it tasted delicious. It was part of a system. It was part of a rotation system that had kept people alive in that part of Germany for you know, centuries. And soil health was a big part of that. And in a way, you know, those those systems uh, in which farmers were working in more harmony with nature have a lot to tell us. And the Swabian Alp for me, that's why it's one of my favourite stories in the book. Yes, and a couple of people have, you know, have mentioned this question that food has much less flavour. Even I know that in my lifetime, that a supermarket carrot is just not, doesn't taste very much of carrot. And, and yet we're, we're all adopting these bland tastes, aren't we, all around the world? Like Coca-Cola yeah. everywhere, Starbucks everywhere, yeah. Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere. Yeah. And again, these are these are these things are really hard to quantify and measure, and they are hotly disputed in terms of the science of. Um, uh, and and I'd love to be involved in another panel discussion on on, on that on that very subject. Um, but it's it's true that um, for the food system to exist as it does today, we have had to breed um, varieties of fruit and vegetables um, that aren't just delicious or nutritious, but they are, they can survive long epic journeys across the world, you know, in CO2 modified atmospheres. Um, and that's why food, uh, flavor and texture became, you know, lower down on the agenda in, in terms of plant breed or, you know, uh, breeding of, of um, crops and, and plant other plants. That's terrific. I have a friend who was very high up in Sainsbury's who's in fact just left and she told me about how the big supermarkets have bred grapes in China and they bred them really sweet because mm. then people sort of look at them like a, you know, like a sweet because all of our palates have become more attuned to liking sweetness yeah. and they've really changed the nature of a grape. Um, now there's a really, a, I, I know we're running over time a bit, but interesting question here from Francis Rubin, would forcing the mega companies to quote the externalities of production 
help. Uh, I, I agree with her. I think it's very interesting for you to take mm -hmm. the so cost, the, the, the idea of true cost accounting around food. So you take in its biodiversity, mm -hmm. its water, its air, and all the other things it's had to use up to get. Yeah, to I, I think that's a really important point. And there is a shift taking place. And I know Patrick Holden at the Sustainable Food Trust is doing some really important work on that right now. But you could even say, even down to, uh, you know, governments looking at their um, health budgets, you know, if type two diabetes continues increasing, what does that mean in, in, in terms of domestic, you know, the, uh, the economies of the world? Um, and also, uh, you know, a fascinating thing that's happening right now that I've been, I've been thinking about looking at is what um, asset managers and uh, in invest, invest, investor networks are doing in terms of assessing the risk in the food system as well. That's going to be a fascinating one to watch. So beyond government policies, beyond consumer behavior, follow the money. I think that's always true. What everyone's trying to do politically, you have to always follow the money. Um, I'm really sorry we haven't been able to get to all your questions, um, but if you buy this truly magnificent book and read it, uh, you will get a lot of them answered. But thank you, you've been an amazing audience and there's fantastically mm, really good questions. Talks and really good questions and, and really great to have so many of you on board with us tonight because this is such an important subject and um, I'm passionate about it and Dan is absolutely the world leader in this idea and this is a this is a book you'll keep forever because you'll just pick it up because you happen to be eating something and you'll think, ah, I wonder, I wonder. And all through it, we we failed uh, miserably in a way to do justice to how rich and how amazing it is. But I hope that we've given you a really good idea. Dan, I'm so grateful to you for giving our time. And I'm incredibly pleased that we're, you know, the, the first event that you've done. And um, thank you. And the book, as I say, is available, all good bookshops, and especially through New and Books, who's our partner. And until we see you again at 5 by 15, have a very good evening. And well, have a really good supper <laughs> and enjoy it. Agreed. Good Thank night. you, Rosie. That was brilliant. So, and, and thanks so much for spending the time to read through the book and not, not only read through it, but really get it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolute treat. Thank you very much. Yeah. And good night to all of you. Good night. <laughs>